Welcome to the podcast that questions everything, from conspiracies to philosophy, from science to religion. We'll be looking at the construct of the illusion, and as always, we will question everything. Excellent, welcome to uh, Everything's an Illusion, the podcast where we question everything. Um, this podcast is podcast number three. We're going to be looking at the film industry and the illusion versus reality. Um, today, I'm your host, Rob Wallace. Today, I have Colin Wood of ColinWoodMedia.com, who is an independent uh, film expert, media expert, and uh, along the line has got me a couple of gigs, which is fantastic. Um, Problem. <laughs> and this is Colin. <laughs> Hello. And we're just going to talk about again the, the various aspects of working in the the film industry, the TV industry, and the reality of that game. Okay, okay. How so would you want to start? I'll start with uh, well, who is Colin Wood Media? What's your uh, some of your qualifications, if you like? What um, I have a honours degree in filmmaking and screenwriting from the uh, University of West of Scotland. Good university. I went there as well. Yep. <laughs> yep. Shared some of the same lecturers. Yep. One one in particular got us a good gig, gig on uh, World War Z. I uh, will come to that in just a second. Yes. Yes. What other qualifications do you uh, do you come to deal with? Um. Well, I've basically a lot of kind of industry experience, mainly in locations department um, and also ADing, um, as well as making my own, you know, things. Um, I have seen myself more as a videographer now because um, basically I'm doing corporate video, or the odd music video, um, and that's yeah, that's pretty much where I'm, I'm making my making my living these days. So an AD, obviously, we'll get we'll try and get away from these. Uh, oh, sorry, the th- terms. Yeah. Okay, assist, AD is an assistant director, and they come in various shapes and sizes, um, from first to third. So your first first AD is practice is basically you are if you think of a building site, he's your foreman. You know, he is basically the voice of the the director, the one that gets everything moving and done. The second AD is basically future planning, so he'll um, basically plan the shoot ahead. Um, he's mostly office based um, and third AD if, if your shoot's big enough to have a third AD is usually responsible for um, your extras and your kind of you know your, your background so basically making the life easier for your first AD That's it. it's quite quite amazing just when you're saying that if, you, if, you, if your set is big enough if your if your uh, film production is big enough you'll have a third and I think it's uh, these sort of things and that I find amazing with the, the sheer size and scale and that's how I first met yourself uh, was as you previously previously just mentioned a little bit it was on the film set of World War Z which was a uh, Brad Pitt Brad Pitt vs Zombies Brad Pitt vs Zombies and the first sort of maybe five to six minutes of the opening sequence was filmed in Glasgow George Square yeah and that's where I met you yourself, and it's, a, it's an interesting. Um, that that for me was my biggest biggest film experience, and it was the first time I ever seen a third AD. You know the guy calling out the extras. Yeah, yeah. I think they had several because it was it was a huge, huge, huge thing, big event. So, uh, how did you get a job? Obviously, like. Some people listening in podcast land may be thinking, you know, I want to be in the film industry. I want to, um, can I, I love shooting films. I love watching television. I love watching films. I could make a fantastic film. I write stuff all the time. I have ideas coming out. My, again, how do I get into film? So we'll just, again, how did you get, obviously you've got a degree in the thing. Yeah, but yep. picking a degree in film, you know, what's the? Obviously, you must have had a dream at some point. You must have had a. Can I am going to be a filmmaker? Yeah. Well, well okay. Well, for me, kind of what made me want to be a filmmaker was more so like 
it's obviously evolved since then, you know, into something different. But for, for me, it was um, probably seeing Clerks, believe it or not, by Kevin Smith. Kevin Smith, classic film. Yeah, I mean, and it's don't get me wrong, it's it's barely a movie, but um, I think it was a, one of the first times I saw kind of characters that kind of I related to in, in a movie, and I was thinking, you know, you know, this is so simple, you know, man, I could do this, you know. Um, and yeah, just basically, I think that was kind of the, the kind of the sort of planted the seed in my head. So basically, um, yeah, that's what planted the seed, and from there, um, I started to look at courses and eventually settled on uh, UWS. So, do you think um, I also went to UWS? I did the broadcast production as opposed to the film and screenwriting. Do you think the university education uh, put you in the right place uh, skill wise experience wise for uh, fulfilling your your ambition to become uh, a filmmaker or it just gave you the time and the surrounded you by the similar minded people and gave you the time to learn these skills on your own um, I would definitely say the latter. Um, learning skills and one um, also gave you resources to learn with. Yeah. You know, booking out equipment and things like that, um, which is what I highly recommend anyone do. Um, education on you know film theory and all that is just not enough. You need to actually go out, pick up cameras, film some terrible short films, and learn from them. Um, we've all done that. I, I have a I have a whole series called Master Wang. Uh, and that's where the master of the MMA show came from, and it was it's like seven videos where I basically got a camcorder, and I was my own director, actor, editor, and I was using Windows at, uh, Movie Maker to start with, yeah, and and then try to progress to like getting some VFX. Uh, I would split the screen in two and film both sides, so I would and put a mask on for yeah. my second character, so I could basically by myself but that uh, having the resources and the time because I was at college and university it gave me the time to learn the yeah can put the things into practice yeah. but again on the other on the other hand I found it very frustrating you know um, being on a course with a lot of people who just weren't into it as much as me and were just kind of skating by Um you know, we're looking at it as an easy degree, and there was plenty of them. There was also plenty of people who were, you know, really into it and wanting to, you know, go out do stuff, you know, build up a showreel, um, you know. Um, but I think, I think, um, I, I, you've you've just got to go out and do it. You know, it's 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 yeah, you know, like the Nike slogan, <laughs> just, just do it. We're, we're not sponsored by Nike, we're sponsored by TheEnergeticMind.com, <laughs> we're sponsored by HealthMadeSimple.info and RobWallaceMedia.com and today we're cool. calling with Media.com. Um, so let's fast forward, you've got your bit of paper, you've got some experience, you are stepping out into the real world, you're looking for a, obviously the biggest gig you can get, you landed one of the biggest gigs that's ever um, hit Scotland, hit Scotland, the World War Z. I know how it came about, how you got that opportunity. How did you get it? Was it your skills? Was it your experience? Was it your... Um, basically, it was through a lecturer um, who he already got me a corporate job. Um, I don't know if I should give him a, a wee sort of name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, basically, it's Paul Tucker, um, who's got you know various industry experience in the past himself, um, mainly in documentary. Um, but he's um, basically he got me a job um, doing a corporate video for um, General Electric Aviation. So I got to go around and walk around, and, you know, film uh, basically jet engines being refurbished, which was quite interesting. Um, it's quite interesting. He got me a job at TUV NEL, yeah, doing their corporate video. Yeah. <laughs> so I think the, the, the Paul Tucker, and the funny thing is, he only took me for one or two classes. He was not one of my full time lecturers, but he saw. I think he saw the fact that I wanted to go out and, you know, make things, you know, um, and he was, you know, more than happy to nourish that. Um, and basically, I think it was one morning, beginning of August, I got a phone call um, from him um, 
was it from him or was it from someone and um, no yeah yeah it was, I got a text actually sorry it was, I got a text from him um, saying uh, do you fancy I have, I have, I have a job as a runner on uh, World War Z and then I took about a, a microsecond to think about it and I'm like hell yeah you know and um, basically he you know passed on my details and I got contacted by the, the people at World War Z and Landed myself a three week gig out of um, you know fresh out of uni. Well, that that was a, a exact uh, exact same for me. Paul again got me that gig. I rocked up. Um, I actually got a second phone call um, from the folk at the locations department saying, "Can you start tomorrow?" Um, yeah, it was was quick. I remember it. And, quick. Uh, so I, I I started the day before the rest of the locations runners yeah um, and I was uh, had a yellow a jacket and I was doing the, the the road stuff for the cherry pickers the day before just moving the the cones for the road uh, safety and I was on the STV news bulletin came when they had uh, World War Z is <laughs> filming and there's a thing with me with a big yellow jacket coffee you know look as if I'm doing nothing you know, and then one of my friends posted up, you know, Greg Andrew posted up, there it is, working in the film industry, doing nothing. And I'm just, again, stunning a bit. And to a lot of people, their perception of the film industry is the big yellow jacket on or some, yeah, you know, yeah. wear the coffee, standing about. But the reality, the, the reality was something different. Yeah, the reality is something different, yeah. That's basically, it's very start stop. You can be standing around for an hour, and then you've got five, five, ten, fifteen minutes of complete anarchy. So just list some of the right. So people are maybe thinking they're thinking, uh, okay, you're working in a Hollywood film set. It's glitz, it's glamour. There's beautiful women with their breasts out. There's gloriously what handsome, <laughs> hunky men. Um, there is, you know, can expense and galore. If you list through some of the kind of jobs that you've done as a locations assistant, uh, locations runner on a Hollywood film set. Um, oh yeah, the, the, the glamour of um, doing water runs, taking water from um, basically the, the, the extras holding area um, up to um, the actual location um, to keep the extras and actors all happy and watered and the crew. Um, Picking up rubbish at the end of the day, you know, making sure um, George Square was, you know, back to its beautiful state um, for the next day shooting. Yeah. And let me tell you something about film crews. They are the most filthy people on the planet for leaving shit behind them. You know, fag ends, um, coffee cups, because basically that's what, how they function, you know, working such long hours, is coffee and um, cigarettes, you know, get all, get get your stimulations. So, so some of the, the the jobs that I remember quite clearly was things like the we had a the BAM building had five floors, six floors, and they floors had to be um, secured and made safe. So there was the kind of sheet fencing that had to get pushed up to every yeah, floor. Yeah, yeah. Every floor had to get the, the various stations built, so for the wardrobe, for the costumes, for the hair and makeup, all their equipment had to by hand carried to their appropriate floor and their appropriate station. That was by us. Yeah. You know, yeah. that that's um the 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 bin uh, or the uh, can the local council picking up the bins. Yeah. All, obviously, the routes were all changed and the bus routes were all changed because of the filming. So it was like moving business or companies and resident bins on a daily basis to new pickup points. These yeah. are some yeah. of the glamour. That, 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 that was one of my glamorous <laughs> jobs as well. Um, but yeah, it was probably worth mentioning the building we were based out of as well was um, it was basically a derelict um, like bank I think wasn't it or like banking building you know head office for just like next or something. It's the building that's nice, new and shiny yeah. that's opposite yeah. the contemporary arts yeah. uh, chem museum now. Yeah. So I mean, like you said, um, basically no no working elevator. You know, all the electricity had to be kind of piped in through uh, you know like Jenny's. Or Jenny's, Jenny's a, like a short term for generator, um, just in case you're not up in your movie lingo. <laughs> um, 
Uh, what else? Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, cleaning toilets as well. You know, got to keep those um, portaloos, you know, kind of clean. You know, there's a lot, lot of people going through, a lot of traffic. I've done a lot of uh, traffic duties, so I, I've done a lot of um, moving pathways, moving cones for the cherry pickers as they rigged various things up, up high. I've also done a lot of gate, uh, allowing access into the site and not allowing access into the site and uh, what's the the term for the big water bunker thing which uh, Bowser. a water bowser that was another of one of my uh, jobs or things that I would regularly get shouted get that water bowser filled you know and you're away trying to they, they're some of the the, the more glamorous a uh, hollywood <laughs> uh, job so like on a day to day shift how many hours are you talking? Day to day shift. Um, depends from shoot to shoot, but um, realistically, your minimum is twelve hours. More realistically, fifteen to sixteen hours. So you're looking at the six a.m. start, all the way to maybe even ten, eleven p.m. at night. So that's one of the things I found quite interesting about the film industry and the TV industry is. If you work in a call centre, you work in a, um, a restaurant, you work in a any other kind of job, a school, whatever, you've sort of set time. Um, so I'm clocking in at eight, I'm finishing at four. Tomorrow I'm clocking at eight, I'm finishing at four. You may be expected to do another 10, 15 minutes at either side of that time slot. But in the film and TV industry, it always seems to be a case of we go when it's finished, yeah. And everybody is in that kind of mentality of yeah. be here for five, hopefully we'll wrap for five, but we might wrap for, you know, and then it's four in the morning the next day, you're hanging on by the seat of your pants and people are still ambitious to complete whatever it is they're completing. Yeah, it definitely, the industry does... Um Definitely does attract hyper ambitious people. Um, you've got to be very, very selfish. Um, very selfish, you know. Um, I, I, it's ideal for people who have don't have families, or, or I don't know, maybe hate their family, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, or they just have you know no intentions of having children. Because the, the thing is, if that's you know part of my re-examination um, over the last few years and refocusing my work was partly due to th- my future. Um, you know, some someday in the next few years, I may want to have a family, and I would be cheating a child if I were working those hours. You know, like on a regular basis. Uh, luckily for you know, luckily or sorry, not luckily, I guess um, I never got to the point for me where I was working. You know, consistently in film and TV, I was very much you know a job a month if I was lucky. I, I, I'm the same. I, I, I've never had that consistency, um, and I'm quite glad of that. On the World War Z film set, three and a half weeks, I lost a stone and a half. I went down two notches in my belt. Yeah. And as you know, um, you ate like a champion for your breakfast. It was like a big American dining. Yeah. Uh, oh, the catering thing. was awesome. Amazing. And for your lunch, for your dinner. And there was a, it was like a big buffet, huge variety. Plus, they had a, it was like a small tent where you could get your paninis, your coffee, your tea, any juice, sweeties. Yeah. And I'd be raiding that thing on an hourly basis. Yeah, it was awesome. I'd be eating my breakfast, and yet I still lost weight. So yeah. it just shows you the amount of calorie and the amount of yeah, energy and standing. activity. Yeah, um, just through standing, most of the day, being on your feet sixteen hours will burn a lot of calories. I actually, uh, he, here's a reality, I think, uh, from working on a film set. I went and bought a foot bath. <laughs> <laughs> I went and bought a foot bath. And uh, in the evening, when you lay on your bed, I, I found it hard to fall asleep because my feet were throbbing so much because the blood would come back in. Aye. And it would go vroom, vroom, vroom. And I grew, honestly, about a millimetre of hard skin Ugh. on the bottom of my uh, feet uh, as they adapted to this yeah. new, um, you know, up at the crack of dawn, on your feet all day, 
bag at the crack of dawn. Yeah. I, I had a blister in between my big toe and the, the, the toe next to it, and I was like, yeah, it was not pretty. Um, I, one thing I definitely recommend if you're going to be get, going into the bottom as a runner, um, invest in a very comfortable pair of shoes. Um, trust me, it's worth it. So I think I think that's a, it's a it's an interesting. So after working and or seeing some of the biggest uh, movie sets that have came to Scotland and having uh, worked in TV and sort of smaller but kind of commercials as well. I've worked in a few commercials. That kind of level. You've now come out of this. Yes. And you're now looking at your own stuff, um, producing your own stuff, creating your own stuff for personal clients or a small business, a large yep. business, they come to you. They so so like me myself, some of the things that um that that I struggled with at the beginning was how do you how do you get away from the student mentality of your friend or a business or somebody saying to you, can you make me a video? How much you got? A fiver? Okay, fine. Free, paid. How do you set a price? How do you get that value for yourself? Mm -hmm. Because you obviously had, you must have had that dilemma. I think everybody who works in yeah, yeah. has had that dilemma. I, st I still have that dilemma as well. I mean, you still get people asking you to do things for free. And on occasion, I'll do things for free if it's interesting to me. Um, but most times, I just tell them, eh, no thanks, you know. Um, Fuck off. Well, yeah. I've got to eat. <laughs> yeah, pretty much, yeah. You know, um, you know, free work does not pay the mortgage. Yep. It's a fact. So, um, right, so basically, for corporate, uh, focusing on corporate work, it was just a great deal of um, luck involved. Um, it was actually after... I I basically came off of a, a shoot um, working on a Bollywood movie called Kick, and basically almost after that, a commercial for um, a German chocolate. Um, it was sold up, filmed in Glencoe, and I think it was a combination of those two jobs um, that kind of made me realise right, I need to refocus and get back get back into my stuff rather than you know um, crewing because. The job, the work is just too inconsistent, and I, I was getting to the point, especially on the Bollywood movie kick, I was not enjoying it one bit. I was hating every single moment of that shoot, um, and uh, you know, I think I'm doing myself not not just myself a disservice, but other people a disservice. Um, you know, who could want you know could take that spot that I'm taking up if I'm not feeling. Into it, you know. If I'm not, if I'm not enjoying the work I'm doing, then what's the point? And uh, that's the way I was feeling about film and TV. Um, you know, the hours were, you know, the hours I did were, were grinding me down um, on the the, the Selling it well here, selling yeah. it well. Well, it's yeah, yeah. Good. Sorry for being negative. So, so, um, so you stepped out of that world. Yeah, basically, yeah, um, yeah, and not just that. I had like a bit of a nasty scare um, coming back from Glencoe at about eleven. At night, you know, um, you know, knackered, um, almost falling asleep at the wheel, and I'm thinking, you know what? Is it worth it? Uh, is it worth it? Is it worth you know being exhausted, um, and you know potentially you know hurt myself or worse? So, I, you know, I, I decided, you know, it's uh, to to me the, the my main gripe with the industry is not necessarily the work; it's the hours, and it's something I'd love to see change. But um, if you're being honest, it's not gonna. It's not gonna. Um, There's too many people who want to step into the illusion of working in TV, working in Hollywood, working as a, a cameraman, a director. And I think it's very similar to a lot of the other creative industries. You're either a struggling musician, struggling author, struggling camera, or you're at the high end. You're making good yeah. money. There doesn't seem to be a, a, a very tangible middle ground yeah. in the creative industries. Yeah. I, I, I think the perception is, you know, it's like, oh, it's an easy gig, you know, it's like, you know, it's got, got to be something I enjoy. And you, I think the reality is, um, it's really hard work. It is really hard work, you know. Even even like when you're not working, making phone calls and you know, like emailing people, bothering people, you know, you know, reeking of desperation, trying to get work. <laughs> 
Um, it's it's just I think you've just got to you've got to really question your commitment to it. And it got to the point with me. Um, I was I felt like you know after a couple of years being doing run hour work and um, the odd location assistant job and AD job, I was treading water. I didn't feel like I was getting anywhere, and it wasn't making me happy. It was making me miserable. Um, and I decided right, we focus on my work, and um, yeah, um, just a great deal of luck kind of hit. I basically got a a job on a corporate for SSE. A couple of months after I, you know, refocused, and then the following year I landed a, almost a, a semi-permanent rolling job with um, a company called Technic. Um, yeah, I actually know that company because I went for that job interview as well. Oh, and I got it. And you got it. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I, man, I didn't even know that. <laughs> <laughs> I went for that job as well, and it was right next to the airport. Um, yeah. And I went in and it was the, I think he was like a bald guy, big earlobes if I remember right, loads of Asian stuff in his uh, office. Yeah, uh, and, that would uh, be Steve probably. And I was talking away and stuff and at that time I was just starting Big Rolf's Hot Sauce as I was extremely enthusiastic about my hot sauce and at the same time it was, when I went for the interview it was in a one day a week kind of two day a week max and I was like this will be perfect you know for me I can take my filler man I yeah. can then make my hot sauce and uh, but at the same time I, I was travelling from press week at that point uh-huh. um, so I'm guessing that's why you got the job because I, I was too far away you know <laughs> oh yeah 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 uh, um, yeah I, 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 I've no idea how I got the job um, I'm very because grateful I did Good skills. I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful what I did, and it's 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 been a dream job. You know, it's the corporate world is very different from film and television. It's you know, it's you get treated like a human. Yes, you do. You get um your your skills are valued. People value you. You are actually a person who the the way I've I've found uh, this uh, kind of world is people need your skills they want to market their business they want yeah. to provide solutions for their customers they want um, can all the kind of things that you and I have they require and they treat you very well yeah the, you, you're, you are treated well and you're paid well as well and that's that's another thing you know um, like we should probably get on to is you know uh, pay in film and television there's a lot of exploitation going on so, so I, th- I think the, the the classic would be um, how much do you get paid on World War Z? I got I think seventy five pounds a day. Seventy five pounds a day. So the extras were on ninety pounds a day. Yep. Uh, so that's the bottom rung of extra. I think yep. the the military like yep. you know, extras were one hundred and forty. Um, I know the floor runners got paid more than we did. So so uh, basically you, yeah. So with the lowest paid on. Like so, so yeah. in a in a in seventy five pounds a day, but you're talking maybe minimum fourteen yeah. hour yeah. kind of days. Yeah, I mean seventy five pounds a day on an eight hour day is fantastic. You know, it's it's as a living wage. But on a sixteen hour day, it boils down to less than minimum wage, which is absolutely ridiculous. And the way the industry gets around it is, you know, you're you're agreeing to a day rate, you're signing a contract saying this is how much you get per day, not specifying how long a day will be. So um, they've got that sewn up. And you feel as well there's a lot of pressure because you may be working on a team of five people and everyone else is trying to climb the ladder. They're super ambitious. Oh, yeah. And no one wants to step up and say, look, we're at 14 hours, people. Let's call it a day. Yeah. Yeah, everybody's hanging. Yeah. You know, nope, here's some sugar. <laughs> see, see, the thing is, I think if I were to go back and do some of these, you know, some, some running and things like that, I'd probably have a lot more fun with it because I'm in a situation where I don't need the industry. So, you know, I would be like, oh, well, well that's 12 hours I'm off. You know, I, I think I, I think I would. And, you know, probably showing a bit of balls is probably a good thing. Yeah. You know. Because um, it's the only way that that industry will change. Yeah. Um, and that that's the problem is, yeah, that it's, it's capitalising desperation of people. And, you know, a lot of... Kids coming out of university, you know, you know, like all wide-eyed and inexperienced, you know, like twenty, twenty-one. 
you know, they're like, you know, like, yeah, this is awesome, this is awesome, yeah, you know, like, they don't know any better, they don't know what they should be paid, you know, and Beck 2 is very useful for giving you sort of standard day rates, and um, that's like the union for um, film and television, um, in the UK anyway, um, so it's a case of, you know, it's good to sort of refer to that, um, you know, but on a feature film, um, I've done subsequent, subsequent feature films like um, Fast and Fury 6, um, and uh, Kick, you know, the Bollywood Hell movie. Um, basically, um, I was earning, I think, 120 to 130 when those jobs per day, which is a lot more, a lot more agreeable. Um, still not fantastic, but you know, it's a lot more agreeable. Um, uh, and then on your own stuff, again, if somebody's contacting you with regards to. I know that my daily rate is a lot higher than seventy five pounds. Yes, and, I, mine too. and my daily rate is is actually an hourly rate. I, I, I charge per hour, but yeah. I work out <coughs> two hundred pounds. Yeah. Um, depending on or three hundred pounds, depending on um, if you have the ability to pay. I have a I have my own kind of scale, but I'm basically between two and three hundred pounds per day, depending yeah. on if you are a yeah. I I am probably at about. Two hundred pounds a day. Um, again, I'll make, I'll, I'll I'll take things into consideration. For example, if you're taking me on for you know a larger number of dates, you might catch a break in the price. Um, things like that. Um, and, and again, I mean, let's not say I have done things things for sixty quid a day. Usually favours for mates, you know, like yep. um, uh, which, you know. Typically, if it's a half day as well, I'll off 60 quid for a half day, I'm not doing anything else. Yeah, why not? You know? Um, uh, and try to think what else. Uh, yeah, for me, it's definitely it's a set day rate. I, I don't do it by, by the hour. Because um, I've got a rough idea of how long it takes me to do things now. You know, I've been doing editing and filming long enough now to get a, gauge an idea. That's not why I charge per the hour. I... I can have a, a great gauge of how long things take but yep. when you have a regular client or you have um, a smaller mm. sort of thing where it's not going to take two days it's going to take maybe 10 hours or 11 hours I'm going on a standard day of eight hours mm. that's like a day in three hours yeah you know when i'm not i'm not saying that i would that whole idea of charging two days when i actually been an hour and a bit, mm -hmm. a day and a bit. So that's where my hourly kind of yeah, yeah. I, I can I, mean, I can understand that. Like, you know, but that you, that's because I'm working with people. Um, a lot of times I'm working with the same mm -hmm. people again, and again, and again, and yep. it's about building trust with them. Yeah, and showing that yeah I'm a valued part of their team, even though I'm not part of their team. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, that's, that's that's true. That's um, definitely technique. I kind of feel like a, a valued member of the team. Um, and the production managers there have been very helpful in sort of educating me on their product, um, which, um, you know, that was the biggest hurdle with that job was basically understanding the science and then distilling it down into video content that was language neutral because a lot of their clients, customers are, 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 in, are in, in China, you know, Asia. And um, so it's, you know, um, they seem happy with my work so far. Um, uh, but it's when these things are just you know you want to keep getting better and better at communicating you know and it's again a lot like going back into kind of semiotics you know like and meaning of symbols and things like that it's quite good to kind of bring in things like that you know like just symbols because you know symbols are universal yeah but I don't want to go too far into that maybe get back to our kind of general discussion film and TV I, I, I love semiotics but um because uh, I just love semiotics. I, I love the whole idea of symbology because it goes right into everything from um, the way people perceive colour to the symbology of uh, major religions, uh, corporations, uh, the way that they use imagery to convey and, you know, an image does a thousand words. Mm. So does symbols. I think that's... Uh, so w one of the things for myself, uh, working for myself... Um, um, creating video content for a client or whatever and how it differs from working in a TV or film industry for me is 
I have always been a person who I can and I want to write the thing, film the thing, edit the thing, <clears throat> produce the DVD at the end. I want to learn all the new skills. I want to um, fully engross myself in the whole project. I'm a, a generalist, complete mm-hmm. generalist. I love all aspects. And working for myself in the creative kind of industry, you know, doing these kind of projects for clients allows me to do that. Whereas the times I've worked in the industry, I never actually used any skills, any of my creative skills. I used either my physicality, um, I used my um, my ability to get a job done, shout loud, stop traffic, um, things like that. But not once did I actually use any of the yeah skills that I have been honing for a decade yeah uh, to contribute to the film, the creative. People are away in a box somewhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the way I felt as well. And there, there, there seems to be, you know, there des- definitely seems to be a glass ceiling as well in terms of progression. Um, pr- pr- basically, because everyone is fearing for their um, their own sort of livelihood. You know, so you've got to be very cutthroat and ruthless. And I, I am just not that person. Um, I think. Um, Try to think what. I would. Try to think. Yeah, uh, you know, I mean, like there's one guy on World Wars. You won't name him, but he was, you know, sniffing around the camera department. It was fairly obvious that that's where he wanted to go, you know. And good on him. He, got, he had, you know, he had the balls to do it, and he got away with it, you know. Um, um, but uh, you know, I, I was assigned a job, and I wanted to do it as well as possible. That's just kind of my. I don't know my ethic, my work ethic. Um, you know, thinking about the shoot rather than you know my own selfish you know career progression. But at the end of the day, um, you know, I, I find it very hard to sort of try and even get make inroads into sort of the stuff I wanted to get to, the like camera department or you know editing things like that. Um, and for me, it's not necessarily the whole thing because I, I enjoy you know. Um, Working for myself, you know, in the, the working my working for myself aspect. It's um, I don't enjoy everything about it. Um, I hate storyboarding. Um, it's just like it's basically because I hate drawing. Um, and my, I do some of the worst storyboards imaginable. I must admit, my storyboards are pretty bomb proof. <laughs> <laughs> my, my stick men are uh, <laughs> my stick men are are. are, are yeah. Immaculately stick. <laughs> I hate it. I hate it as a chore. Um, uh, for me, it's very much the the filming and the editing, and especially the editing. I love editing. I like the idea of putting something that is basically something together, and it's a bit of a jigsaw puzzle. You know, it's basically you know you have got you know some home movies, and effectively that's all it is. And it doesn't matter how far up the industry you've got, you've got home movies, and then you stitch them together and you create. A story, and whether that story be, you know, about a, a cleaning machine or a, you know, a digger in a ditch, or you know, it it doesn't really matter. You're still telling a story. Well, I, I think um, I, I totally agree. Like uh, uh, storyboarding for me is is quite hard, um, but I enjoy it. I enjoy every aspect of of it all. Um, but I, I love editing as well, and I think editing is such a powerful thing because most people. Uh, it's almost like the person who masters the 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 CD for a band. You know, yeah. most people don't really know they exist, but they'll make or break a band with the mm. sound and what they do to that sound to really make it pop. And the the editor, you know, a really good editor, you won't even know they exist because you'll not see any cuts. You know, mm. you, the, um, uh, what's his name? Akira uh, 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 Kawasari. The Japanese uh, Seven Samurai, um, kind of classic Japanese director editor. Mm. His films are just masterclass in editing because he's always he's always cutting with motion. He's always filling the screen with various techniques, and because he filmed it, and he knows where his edit is going. Yeah, and he understands. I'm going to film this like this, yeah. so I can cut to here. So I'll film this like this. Yeah. And I think that's one of the the best tools as a small producer is you have that control. 
you're not just sending the, 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 the footage away to some random with some notes and have a name sort of pick through um, and create. Uh, <clears throat> and the, the editor as well has so much power. There's yeah. more power than a director. Yeah, the, yeah. The director just has a vision. It's the editor that really does cement. And then the VFX. <sighs> Hollywood <laughs> movies are now, you know, 70 to 80%. VFX, you know, That's and they, they guys, they, they're on a worse deal than us. They, they they make the whole movie and get no no recognition. But yeah, true, true. I, I'm in awe of the talent, though, it takes to do that, you know, and like high level VFX, you know. Um, it's stupendous. Yeah. It's like, a, a, just, just briefly about an example, I put a link to this page, um, the, the film Gravity, 80% of the film... Um, VFX, everybody who's seen it went for the VFX mm-hmm. the actors, George Clooney and Sandra Bullock made a shed load of money but they could have been replaced with anybody because everybody went to see the award winning VFX, you know, and 80% of the film was green screen and recreated um, and they VFX artists are, are, are basically less than minimum wage Slave machines, yeah, uh, and yet, you know, they are the people with the real vision. They are the actual creatives in Hollywood uh, that are producing you your gold. Yeah, yeah, that's that's one of the pitfalls of doing the um, like quoting per job rather than per day. That's a perfect example, actually. You know, um, it's you know you can ban- easily bankrupt yourself um, if you you underquote for a whole job, which is why you know. Why typically? Uh, that's why I've kind of adopted the model of per day. Um, I think per day, per hour, both work. Um, you know, it's you, something that you're defining. Yeah, you, you know, know. My, my 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 time is worth this. Instead of saying, you know, this whole job is worth this because because how much how much work is in a job you you don't know until you're and that's it. a lot of people that are maybe listening to this and maybe just interested in you know the whole idea of film or. The idea of getting a, a bit of insight into the TV industry or the film industry, and one of the interesting perspectives that I have, and you I almost guarantee will have the exact same, is when a client says to you, "You know uh, this video or that video," and you edit it down, you followed everything that they have stated, <coughs> um, <coughs> and the music's wrong or. Yeah. Can we change this or this colour here or yeah. can and you say, Okay, um and you do it and then it gets pushed up the the corporate chain and the person with the real power actually doesn't like that bit of music. So then you re edit it, you do this, you do that and it takes time and time and time of being passed between so many decision makers that if you were paid per hour or paid per day, you would have made twenty grand, but you foolishly accepted two thousand pounds for mm-hmm. the video. Yeah, and that for me was a was a was a real learning experience about yeah. getting your customer to define clearly what it is and asking as many questions as you can at the beginning to define clearly yeah. what it is they are actually wanting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, which is not always the easiest thing, you know. Um, people assume because they know what they want in their head that you'll be able to you you'll be able to read their mind basically. Um, but yeah, an example of you know where a day rate really benefits you is um, I was doing a shoot for SSE of driving up to Aviemore um, to film a, a specialised plough and. Um, so I got there, started filming, and um, within about 20 minutes the plough broke down and wasn't operational for the rest of the day. Now, if I were charging per job, I just made that trip for nothing, you know. But because I was charging per day, at least got I got financial compensation for the day, you know. So I got paid um, for something, you know, because you know, there was no the issue was you know something out with my control. Yeah. So. Um, that's why. Um, so if you're getting in this game, um, per day, 
is the way to go or but pay a river. De- definitely, I think if you're getting in this game, you, you need to sit down uh, and have a good think with yourself yeah. about these sort of things. And also things like um, saying to your client, this, this rate or this, uh, and again, if you are charging per video, this entitles you to one re edit mm-hmm. or um, three yeah. edit changes yeah. and defining these. Um, because if you don't, you know, some avid clients uh, say that uh, one big corporate, uh, I'll no name them, I'm not as brave as you, um, mm-hmm. that it was at one level, the music was fine. Everything was a okay, but when it went, when it was after two months, when it went to the final um, sort of head, the main individual who had the power to sign it off, they at that point said, "I don't like this music. Is there another option here?" Mm-hmm. When you had just spent two months editing six minutes to that music to that music oh, and, and buying the, 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 the right to the music to you know everything was music and, and that's a, the big thing I think I I'm quite as audio how important audio is um, to a video production yeah, it, well, again, depends on the video. I saw a lot of the videos I do for Technic are completely soundless. Oh, well. <laughs> so, but, <laughs> but, but, um, for their very specific use, that's kind of what they need, you know. Yeah. Um, you know, um, they don't really need some, some stock, you know, um, kind of, you know, corporate jingle to go with it. Um, but I, I was mainly talking about the, the kind of audio of, like, um, well recorded voice right well then, what, what, then we're talking now we're talking something completely different yeah um, for me um, shitty audio is a much bigger hurdle to what me watch sitting down and watch a video than um, shitty video oh no no for sure and there, there's that classic um, you take two pieces of video footage and they're shaky and horrendous and one has fantastic audio and the other one has windswept, hmm. crackly death audio. The first video could pass for a music video, yep. and the second video will not pass mm-hmm. for anything. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people um, who are getting into producing videos or they think they want to work in a film or mm-hmm. industry, they're still, if they're new to the game, they're still thinking visually when a lot of it is actual. Yeah, it's sound, yeah, yeah, it's very underrated. Um, uh, I was actually I watched a, a web show recently um, featuring a, an actor friend in, in it. Um, won't name it because I'm going to critique it. Um, but um, basically, yeah, um, it the biggest letdown was the audio. You know, um, you could hear you could hear the cuts. You know, and that just totally takes you out the experience. You know. Um, edit is no longer invisible it's now become very visible yeah you know and I mean um, a lot of it could have been you know I, it may be ed- the, whoever edited the sound the sound editor's problem maybe doesn't, doesn't know how to hide the kind of the cuts or it or it could have been the sound recorders didn't get enough you know atmosphere for every location and day you know to kind of just hide those cuts you know well, I, I, I've put my hand up I, I, I've made uh, some short films with Hingway Films that I make my, my short films with and we done um, one called Table Talk mm-hmm. um, some good actors and actresses and the and it was my bad um, I was too far away kept my microphone um, was too far away from the audio so by the mm-hmm. time it got there it was like when you listen back it's like in a cave Yeah, and there's nothing yeah, okay. I, I, I mean I've done it as well. Sometimes it's just technical limitations. I mean, especially when you're kind of a self shooter like us. You know, we're kind of we're, we're we're collecting equipment as we go because it's, you know you can't you know it's pricey. It's it's, it's an expensive hobby. <laughs> um, you know, you're collecting equipment as you go, and because you know most of the emphasis is usually on visual. You know, usually your sound equipment is sort of like last on the chain. You know, or near the last in the chain, and usually the least understood by yeah. the videographer or yeah. the um, the 
like how to manipulate yeah. sound. I, I had to take myself back onto YouTube, which is the the real university where I got my degree. Yeah, um, damn right. And and watching some amazing videos on sound, sound editing, yeah. um, and how important sound. Yeah. As just to digress slightly, if um you were you're fifteen, sixteen, you are thinking about you know making some short films, maybe your friends in a band, you want to make music videos. Just some top tips. What sort of... Get a camera, any camera. Phone, mobile phone. Even that, yeah. yeah. Um, um, I mean, iPhone 6 shoots some very, very nice footage. Um, you know, um, just, yeah, get a camera and just, just learn, just do it. Um, don't expect you don't get disheartened if it doesn't turn out to be any good um, you know if you, you need to make 10, 20 before you start seeing any improvement really you know you've you've got to kind of you, you know I think you've got to just sit back and look at your mistakes I still do that when I've, I make a video as well as like I'll take a break from it usually you know I um, um, once I've completed it and I'll sit back and watch it maybe two weeks later maybe two months later and then I'll be like mm, I don't like that I don't like this I don't like that who could have done this differently and um, you know I, I think everyone in, in our, our kind of game does that you know I'd be surprised if you know someone edits something and goes like oh that's fantastic you know I think everyone is everyone is a self-critic they're their own worst critic you know um, and also I think um, a big mistake I made when I was in uni as well was I didn't give my work to like other people for fresh perspectives. I think, um, especially in uni, because in uni, uh, like your works tend to be more personal, and you've got a bit of emotional investment in it, and sometimes criticism's kind of hard to take. Well, I think that's one of the. Uh, uh, you went back to university as a mature student the second time, I'm yeah. guessing. Yes. Um, and I went there as a as a mature student the second time I went to university. Um, and by that time, I had I had a very clear in my head. Um, if somebody is criticising my work, they're criticising my work. They're criticising my idea. They're not criticising me yeah. as an individual. Yeah. Uh, and that was really again, good um, for me because I was that guy that would kind of um, say to the team. I gave up my job to come and get the best degree I can get. I'm getting an A for this project. If you only get an A for this project, go and get on somebody else's team because I'm not carrying you. Yeah. I'm not interested. Um, again, I was quite ruthless and a couple of people, you know, had to go and speak to some lecturers and stuff and then can people lecturers and saying like you can't speak to people as you can and it's like, well, I've made a conscious choice in life you know, to invest money and time to get best bit of paper. And if that young cat who, by whatever means, entered the same group as me through random choice, picked out a hat or by a lecture putting them in the group, um, then my grade and my has to uh, reflect their lack of work. No. Yeah. No, that's not happening. You yeah. Know? Um, and that's that. I think the... Okay, because I experienced the reverse of that, me criticising people, yeah. and I wasn't criticising them as an individual, I was criticising the, the idea of the work they were putting forward, yeah. I was like, why are you the editor when I can edit better than you, why Why have I accept this, you know, that yeah. that's not acceptable, yeah. I'm producing better stuff than this, I'll re-edit that, no, I'm the editor in this team, and it's, well, let's work together, let's go we'll into the, again, the work booth, Come put mine, we'll go to yours, brother, yeah. and we will work on this and get everybody's skills. Yeah. Because yeah. you've got loads of stuff that I need. Again, and I've got loads of stuff that you need. Let's. Yeah, yeah, trade skills. Yeah, well, that's. Yeah. But then, then it all comes to the insecurity thing. They're trying to take my job. Blah, blah, blah. You know, um, and I've had, I encountered that myself, you know, like trying to help people out, and, you know, you end up, you end up sending people in the half with you because. You know, you're giving advice, or you know, and it's it's a shame. I've lost a few friends actually through stuff like that. Um, you know, and, through and uni, it, um, which is a shame. And that thick skin is something that 
anybody who actually wants to go and work in the real industry of the TV, well, or you need to have it. You've got to have like rhinoceros, <laughs> and, you know. Yeah, it's like so yeah. thick. It's you need, you need to be you need to be Superman. Uh, you need to be bulletproof. <laughs> um, yeah, it's um, you, you've you've got to have a thick skin, and I think the advantage we had being older um, is that you know we're well, a little mature, you know, um, and you know we can take criticism to a degree. Um, 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 but the, the, again, that's why I actually quite enjoy corporates for that reason because they are not emotionally invested in the video. You know, it's a case of you're doing a job for a client. The client's word is God. There you go. You know, it's um, at the end of the day. That's it. You know, it's it, it, to me, it's it's good. You know, not worrying, having to worry about your own ego. Um, which for me, like even like the past five years, my ego has kind of diminished. Really, I, I think it's a byproduct of entering your thirties. You kind of, you, you kind of stop caring about you know like, you know, how you look and you know okay. how you how you're perceived. I've never cared, cared really about that. that these uh, these kind of things. I've always been. Well, you mean those shorts aren't a fashion choice? No. <laughs> so I'm wearing some funky shorts here in the Everything Is an Illusion podcast headquarters. Um, a, a really great guy called Owner Kardalolu, Owner the Son of an Eagle, Turkish guy that I met at university the first time I went and I studied mechanical engineering. And uh, he, this was 1998, 99, and he said. Uh, Small people talk about um, like relationships or you know gossip, and medium minds talk about um, concepts, and big minds talk about ideas. Mm. Um, and maybe it was my ego that wanted to identify with a big mind. Yeah. And but I was always, and I always have been, uh, and ideas. Mm question everything hence the podcast that kind of so the the asking questions about how people perceive what people um and and, and that's one of the the reasons i like film making and making short films mm. and making my own projects so mm. much because you get to challenge and ask loads of questions about you know what is a relationship? What is love? What is mm. uh, action? What is and how does this color affect this? Or how can we write a story to ask questions about this war or this political agenda? Or and that's for me the beauty of yeah. you know film making. Why it's it's because it's a it's a potent um, medium for propaganda it's a potent medium for bias uh, and forgetting and one of the other things that comes from that is the fact that the propaganda machine of Hollywood has continuously um, been in the hands of the rich and the powerful and today citizen journalists and citizen kind of filmmakers or guerrilla filmmakers can now buy off the shelf consumer technology, mobile phones, the sort of equipment that we have, uh, high-level digital SLRs and um, a broadcast quality a camcorders, yeah. etc., that you can actually create content to the same level as a national broadcaster, but from your own office, which is fascinating. Yeah, yeah. Um, and powerful. It, it is, yeah. Um, however, um, the, all, the benefit... Um, you know Hollywood or you know, even your even a mid level indie has is people you know distribution like, yeah well no it's a distribution but just people you know you've got you've got people yeah you've got people in the right places to you know get the movie out there you've got you've got a lot of people on the ground you know doing the work you know doing the, the heavy work heavy lifting um you know you've got a dedicated sound guy you've got a dedicated you know DOP and you know you've got your B cameras you know you've got your your, your B unit you know you've got everything you've got a cook you know yeah you know yeah you've got your makeup artist you've got everything you need um you know so uh, water bowser boy yeah yes <laughs> so basically I mean it's going to be you know Hollywood will always be more polished always be more slick but um you don't necessarily need to be slick to tell a story and you don't necessarily need to be slick to make a good 
looking film, you know, I mean, I've seen some good looking films shot on DSLR, I've seen some, you know, good looking, I've seen, I've seen a good, a good looking film, um, filmed on that old, um, Panasonic Handycam, um, actually, uh, yeah, film worth mentioning, um, I think it's on record as like the cheapest, um, one of the cheapest movies ever made, um, Colin, it's about, a, it's a zombie movie from the zombie's perspective. I actually got a, a good shout out yesterday. Uh, I was doing some um, a, for a film that's coming up, that I'm, and it was called a- Attack of the Herbals. Right. And it's a, a feature film shot in Aberdeen. Right. And it's some sort of a herbal thing that comes from the sea, I think. And they eat it, and it turns people into zombies. Um, and the boy uh, Martin was telling me it's uh, he runs the deep fried film festival in uh, Coat Bridge, and it's now again all over Scotland. Mm-hmm. And he was telling me it's a fantastic film, genuinely funny, but a, a great example of yeah. no budget or low yeah. budget yeah. Scottish yeah. Can film making. Well, that's the thing, you know. Actually, the the, the benefit of low budget filmmaking is. It removes it removes the polish that, that sometimes distracts from the story, so it has to be the story has to be has to be top notch. If it's not, then it's just going to be another crappy short movie that will, you know cra- crappy movie that will be in a long list of crappy movies. I had a I had a um, a, a college lecturer called Ian Downey, um, he was an ex firefighter fireman, and uh, he said uh, I was complaining about the the software they never had a non-linear editing suite and they said Rob your story is rubbish that's the thing you should be <laughs> get, can, mm-hmm. like working on you yeah. know and it, it clicked you know it, it, the the camera the edit all that sort of stuff is like walls and roof and a chimney mm-hmm. the story or the, yeah. the idea the plan the is the foundation of how you're going to build mm-hmm. so, your See, I think you and me are quite different in the sense that you are very much about, you know, wanting to tell stories, whereas me, I, I'm happy being a facilitator now. Um, I'm sure there's a short story in me, or a, a short movie, or maybe in a feature in me. Um, or technically, I've, technically, I've already done one, you know, documentary, rockumentary, if you will. Yep, yep. But, um, uh, you know, like a feature-length movie, and there's probably one in me, but it's just a case of it's the effort of sitting down to write it that's you know you've got to be in the mood and, and that's the, the the other thing with that is when you are um as skilled as we are and you're thinking about all these different facilities you're a journalist you are looking at even a three minute video becomes a lot you're thinking about how that thing is built you know the framing the lenses you know the lighting the 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 various uh, formats that you're going to shoot in for your mm. edit. You're thinking about your music, your edit. Your, there's so many different things to consider that on a big TV production or a big Hollywood production, you have you know 50 people. Somebody to choose your lenses. Somebody to yeah. to scout the location. Yeah. Somebody to you know speak to the actors and actresses and get them worked up and get them yeah. on point. Whereas in a short film. It's one or two, well, no budget. It's one or two people yeah. that are doing that. The thing I love about no budget, and if you just you use at home, can see this. But if Colin looks to his right, you can see a, a, a sort of jib crane that I've built, and various other kind of. That's the thing I like about no budget. Low budget is you don't have four thousand pounds to spend on, you know, a swing arm. Yeah, but you have. Thirty pounds to go to B and Q and buy the stuff that you need yeah. to build a jib arm. Yeah. And YouTube University to can give the instructions and the dimensions. Yeah. And that's thing um, your your lighting kit is, you know, like you know, table lamps or work lights or yeah, it's you know, it's actually you you've got to be quite inventive. And and that creativity is that leads to good quality short films because you, you're not just throwing money at a solution mm. you're actually creating solutions you're using the same skills 
that you would be using to create short films to tell stories. You're using the same creative skills to get your way around problems as opposed to saying, here's 500 quid, we'll buy this. Here's a £1,000, we'll buy this. You're using... Yeah, definitely. Um, right, you. So uh, what else would you like to talk about in terms of the industry? I think... Uh, we're quite close to just wrapping that up. Um, I'm just going to check the... Yeah, we're at one hour and five minutes. Um, God, we can talk some shit. That's it, yeah. <laughs> um, I'd just like to fire in some stuff uh, about Hollywood and a conspiracy to get some folk thinking about Hollywood. Um, just some quick ones. Um, you, you've probably heard these ones before. Hollywood or the Holly Tree is the wood uh, that magicians or druids would use to manufacture their wands. So Hollywood, being the name of the propaganda industry or the main major cinema industry, is based on the idea of the wand uh, that casts a spell, magic illusion, over its um, viewers. So it's quite an apt name, Hollywood. And where does that come from? It comes from this idea of them casting a spell over the audience um, and it comes to the tree for the that druids would make their wand out of um, Harry Potter's author J.K. Rowling, she was all about this she talked about Harry's wand was made of Hollywood uh, the red carpet it's always something that fascinated me you see these awards of the red carpet the Oscars and the red carpet supposedly eats back to the Old Testament to uh, Faris and Zara and it represents a blood path or bloodline from the past running into the future and my last one on the kind of Oscars Hollywood is this again they things that we this is what I love about you can question different what is that Oscar it's a wee golden man standing that wee golden man has a sword yeah and when you look at it and there's a lot of talk about the idea that it's a Knights Templar which is a kind of secret society, standing with his sword and standing on a five-spoked uh, reel of film, so the five spokes of pentagram. It's very occult and very, um, uh, uh, again, symbols, uh, semiotics, you know, the thing that drives the background of everything. Um, yeah. well, I think it is quite apt for um, the, 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 the sort of Hollywood machine, you know, and there's definitely a... There's definitely a few people who run it all, you know, almost well, yeah, secret society. But there is only what, four or five uh, companies. Yeah. Um, and so, the, sooner or later, uh, Disney will own everything. Yep. That's 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 the way it's going. Yeah. And and that propaganda as well, like there's a j- just as an example, there there is many theorists. Um, obviously, if you like the moon landings, there's, we've done a podcast on the moon landing. That's number one. Check it out on everythingsillusion.com. But like, if you look at Transformers, they done a a, a movie mm-hmm. where on the far side there was an alien base, yeah. you know, and this kind of. Um, whereas, if a conspiracy theorist says or asks that question, you know, is there aliens? Again, is there a a base on the moon? you can instantly go to ridicule mode because you've just watched Transformers. So it's a way of um, using the propaganda machine to um, cement that people don't ask questions because it's an easy ridicule. And the other side of the propaganda machine is the enemy is always clear. In the 80s, Arnie always fought against Russians. You know, then Denzel Washington was fighting against Arabs. You know, it's it's a very clear um, for Joe Blogs to watch and say, "This is our enemy." Yeah, well, that's a very good point. Um, unfortunately, a lot of people pay attention to that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, including the president of the United States, yep. not Obama, Bush. It's, uh, it's an interesting thing. Well, let's just wrap that up there. We've got um, in the Everything's an Illusion podcast booth today, we've had uh, Colin Wood, um, who is of colinwoodmedia.com. Check out his stuff. 
Um, I'm Rob Wallace, your host. Any final words, Colin? Um, I'm just amazed you managed to get a Michael Bay movie reference in this whole thing. We're talking about filmmaking. I actually think Michael Bay is a fucking dick. <laughs> 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 I, I don't like Transformers. Well, I, I, I kind of I like the movie for that's the, the beautiful thing. Sorry, you know, just say we're, we're funny, but that's a beautiful thing about film making. I don't like his films, but I appreciate. Uh, and I can watch these films because I can appreciate all the VFX that goes into it. Um, 72 hours render time for Transformers 2 per second. 72 hours per second render time for, for the... Um, and things like the colour spectrum. The Every character, every human is orange and all their clothes are beige. Um, and that's the day with Adobe's yeah. cooler colour system. And again, so... In every single film that you watch, as a filmmaker, as somebody who's interested in this stuff, there's always something to learn, always something to pick out, always something to uh, inspire. Even if you think the film shit. and the story <laughs> is absolute balls. True. <laughs> True. Excellent. Thank you very Thank much you. for for coming along, and uh, hopefully get you on again to talk about something different. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Cheers. Everything is an illusion is brought to you by RobWallaceMedia.com Award winning media TheEnergeticMind.com Inspirational, motivational and thought provoking art And Health Made Simple By today, change your life forever HealthMadeSimple.info Thank you And remember Question everything Everything